not a series, but a, a two-part sermon. And I say two-part because I really wanted to do one, but I knew there's no way I'd get through the whole thing in one sermon. I knew it. And in fact, I'm still curious if I'm going to get through this one. And, uh, but we started a two-part sermon on living the single life. Now, uh, praise the Lord, if, if God has allowed you to be married or allowed you to have that relationship, that's a great thing. Uh, but there's a lot that don't. And so uh, I want to, because we preached on family day and I preached on marriage and I preached on uh, raising children and parenting. By the way, if you'd like to go to our YouTube page, Peakview Baptist Church, you can listen to that sermon if you want some. It's good marital advice, not from me, but from the Lord. And uh, that's, that's the best place to get the marital advice. But I realize, you know, I'm only preaching to a chunk of the crowd when I'm preaching on marriage. Now, maybe some are saying, oh, I'm hoping one day to be married, but maybe they're not. And so I, God had led me to preach on the single life. It's actually been something I've been preparing for a long time. Now, just before we start, I want to be clear. I'm what's known as an expository preacher. Now, I'm not trying to throw big words at you to impress you because I'm not that smart. Uh, but an expository preacher simply does this. I, I usually start at the beginning of a book and I go chapter and by chapter, verse by verse, and I exposit and explain the passage. And typically, we're in the book of Luke on Sunday mornings, and we've been in the book of Luke since 2019. And I've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, explaining everything that I can explain about it. And that's normally how I preach. Now, there's another way of preaching. There's actually other ways than this, but one of the other ways is called topical. It's where you kind of select a topic and use the Bible to show, to teach on that topic or preach on it. That's what this would be considered. I'm not a huge fan of it. Here's why. It's easy to abuse the scriptures when you're being topical, meaning you can, I can, I can use portions of scripture to make them say anything I want them to say. I can get you convinced of all kinds of stuff. And so I don't want to do that today. So I want to, I, I'm not going to cover all the context. First Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians chapter seven, some of that we did two weeks ago. You'll get some of it today. Uh, but this first Corinthians chapter seven is known as the, for, from chapter seven to 11, the ask me anything passage. This is where, the, the church of Corinth got to ask Paul anything. And so one of the big problems in the church of Corinth was they thought you were more spiritual if you were single. Strong argument to be made. Um, uh, here's why. Here's why. Paul was single. Apollos was single. Timothy was single. A lot of these giants of the faith that they saw were single. So they got this idea in their head. Well, if I want to be more spiritual, I need to be single. And so a lot of guys were like, can I divorce my wife so I can be more spiritual? And Paul's like, whoa, you're an idiot. No, that's not quite what he said. <laughs> we're going to read some of what he said, but I want to, uh, this is to answer me anything. And we're talking about the single life. So if you would please stand in honor of God's word, something else we get from the Bible. If you're able, we like to stand for the reading of God's word. They did that in the book of Isaiah. And uh, we like that still today. I think it also helps you pay attention a little bit better. Uh, if I'm being honest, <clears throat> we're only going to read two verses. We read, we read verses one through eight, uh, two weeks ago. I'm just going to read verse seven and eight, and then we'll kind of jump in. Verse seven says this, for I would, this would be Paul talking to the single people, for I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and one after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time. In your word, I ask that you bless it. Lord, be with my throat. Whatever's going on here, Lord, just alleviate that immediately so that I could communicate your word clearly. And Lord, help us to, uh, we want to have a good time through the preaching, Lord, but help us to also realize the truth of your word, to be convicted by it, to be changed and challenged. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to quote Dieta. I think there's a frog in my throat. <coughs> my daughter says, it's still so silly. Dieta says there's a frog in her throat. It's still so silly. And he had his legs crossed. All right. All right. So I titled this real original, The Single Life Part Two. Because again, this is all kind of one sermon. And I want to remind you of some statistics why I felt like this was such a needed thing. Uh, this, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, in 2018, 51% of adults between 18 and 34 are single. Single. That's a 30% increase from 1970. And it, it's really showing a cultural shift. Uh, it used to be kind of the goal was to get married pretty, I think it was pretty close after high school, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I wasn't there. So some of y'all older folks are going to have to like nod if that was true. Some of y'all look at me like oh, I'm big eyed. I'm not, I'm not trying to lie. I just didn't know. I was born in the 90s. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Okay, anyways. Uh, so I guess that was a big cultural shift. Singles now for the first time outnumbered married people for those over 60. 
And that's most of those would be people that were, were married and now are divorced. But now there's more single people over 60 than married people over 60. Also, since they've been keeping track of it, first time that they can figure in history. Every year, the average age of first marriage has gone up. As of 2019, the average age of first marriage was 29 for men and 27 for women. Seniors comprised, and senior citizens, not seniors like seniors in high school, uh, but seniors comprised 18% of people, of single people in America. So again, older people, there's a lot of older singles as well, not just young singles. So what does this have to do with the church, you're wondering? Why do you, uh, like, what does it matter if there's single people? Well, on average, about 23% of adults in churches today are single. And that's, uh, that's a little bit, I think it might be more for, I don't know, I never sat down and kind of did the stats, uh, but it's 40% in our culture, and I actually think here in Florissant, there's probably more singles than there are in most places. But that means this, one out of every four adults in the church are single. Meanwhile, 40% of the community is single. All that to say, well, we gotta, we got to help them too. we got to help them too. Now, I, I mentioned this last week, and I want to hammer on this again. I believe, and this is just Stephen Jones, if you, don't, if you don't agree with this part, this isn't Bible, this is me, so you can throw this away if you don't like it. But I believe we've made an idol out of marriage in our society and in our churches more than it, more in our churches than our society because our society is actually going away from marriage. Um, but in our church, we're, we're, we're like, everybody, we're just like, oh, we've got to get them married. We gotta get, and it's like, if they don't get married, man, they're just not as useful to the Lord. They're not going to do as much. We've got to get everybody married. And it's like we've got this idea that, that man, if you want to do something for God, you got to be married. And if you're not married, then what are you doing wrong? And I want to say that's, that's, that's faulty thinking. That's faulty thinking. And I also diagnosed this a few weeks ago. I kept wondering, why, why is it that married people always want everybody else to be married? And I came to this conclusion. Because men were, us married men are so miserable, we want all men to be... No, I'm just kidding. That was, that was, me. That was me. I came to this conclusion. If you love being married, which I love being married. I, I, joke, I, I say it all the time. I'll, you'll never hear me joke about the ball and chain, about the, all the... My, you know, you'll never hear me joke about that. My wife is the second greatest gift God has ever given me. I mean that with all my heart. And we, she's my best friend. I, I, I'd rather hang out with her than anybody in the world. I'd rather spend time with her than anybody in the world. And we, I love it. But because I love it so much... I can see how people who do love marriage would say, man, you ought to get married. But that may not be God's plan for them. Now, if that's God's plan for you, praise the Lord. By the way, Paul very clearly states, uh, uh, therefore, if you're married, uh, what, what verse was that? I guess I should have written it down or looked at had it specifically. It's right here in chapter 7. He said, if you're married, basically, don't seek to lose your wife. Don't seek to get rid of her. And if you're not married, don't seek to get married. But now we'll jump back into our passage, and I'll, I'll, I just want to recap last week's message, and I'm going to try to do it fast. So don't slow me down, all right? Some of that's y'all's fault. You give me this look right here like, like you didn't catch what I just said, then I feel like i got to elaborate, so don't give me that look. So some of y'all just got to learn to like, control some of your facial expressions. Here we go. That's you, Nathan. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right, Paul said in verse number 7, For I would that all men were even as myself. What he's referencing there is single. So Paul was, I believe this, now there's no spiritual evidence, or no uh, scriptural evidence, but to be a part of the Sanhedrin, which Paul was before he was saved, you had to be married. So odds are, Paul was married, am I hearing something, or is that my mind? That's just me? I'm going crazy. Well, I heard the heater getting on, I'm going to green. That's not good, I'm going crazy. Oh, is your watch? Oh, that's like, there's like a high-pitched noise, I'm about to go nuts. that, okay. I'm not crazy, everyone. Well, that's still a forbid, I guess, but it's not the most. Uh, wherever I was. Oh, to be a part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. So Paul had to have been married at one point. But once he got saved, it's believed that his wife, who would have been a staunch Jewish believer, who would have been with him, who probably would have had a dad who was like a high priest or a chief priest or something, she left him. She dumped him. That's probably part of where Paul got what he says later on, which is where if, you have, if you're saved and you're, mar- and you're married to somebody who's not saved and they de- de- desire to leave, to let them. It's probably where he got that because it probably happened to him. And so Paul is a single guy. He was looking at the lay of the land. He was looking at all that he had to go through as a single guy. And he's saying, I think it'd be good if everybody were single. Now, that's hard to say as a married guy. I love marriage. Again, I love marriage. And I, I love marriage. But he said, I think it'd be good if everybody uh, were even as I. But he understood that that's not God's plan for everybody. So he lets us know that there is a gift of singleness and a gift of marriage. Here's what he goes on to say in verse uh, uh, number seven. But every man hath his proper gift. If you're single, that is a gift from God. You say, well, 
Feels more like a curse, brother. <laughs> Sometimes I, I bet it does. I, I literally, I was talking to Mike Marshall, and if you, if you were here last week, he, he talked about how he was single all the way into his 50s. He got married when he was like 56 or 7. First marriage, 56 or 7. And so we were talking about that, and I said, I don't know what it's like to be single. Holly and I have been together since high school. We got engaged in high school. I literally have never experienced life without her. Not even adult life. I mean, adolescent life, it's been her all my life. And so I don't even understand. So I'm not going to pretend to say, oh, yeah, I know what it's like, guys. I can't stand up here like Mike Marshall and look at you and I and say, I know what I wanted, and it was to be married and have kids. I don't understand that. So I'm sure sometimes you're saying, it feels like a curse, but it's a gift. It's a gift. By the way, marriage is a gift, too. If God's called you to be married, it's a gift. You say, well, maybe your wife's a gift. You've got to meet my wife. I don't have to meet your wife. You married her. Why'd you ask her to marry you if you didn't like her? By the way, duh. And if you don't like him, why'd you, why'd you say yes? Well, because I felt guilty. Who cares? Let him cry. I'd rather him cry now than me cry for the rest of my life married to the wrong person. I'm just saying. Sorry, I'm not sympathetic for people that go, I just don't know why I'm in this relationship. I'm like, because you're an idiot. Okay, anyways, here we go. Uh, so then... Um, so Paul got through talking about intimacy, and we covered some of that. I don't want to go over it all again, but basically verses 1 through 5, we can summarize it this way. Paul's basically saying, ladies, if you're married, your body belongs to your husband. Guys, if you're married, your body belongs to your wife. That means you belong to each other. That means get busy. Well, pastor, that's not, no, that's exactly what he said. The Bible talks a lot about intimacy. God wrote a whole book about it. Just be clear on that. If you're married... Get busy. Well, I'm too busy to get busy. Well, then get less busy so you can get more busy. Amen? And uh, that's biblical. Biblical. Moving on. I don't want to cover all that again. I covered it more in depth if you want to go listen to the, the, the sermon from two weeks ago. Uh, so Paul gets through talking about the intimacy, and then he gets into this single life. And he lets them know it is a gift. And it is a gift worth keeping. Look at verse 8. A gift worth keeping. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows. So he's not just, he's talking to people who have never been married. Then he's talking to people who maybe their spouse has died. And he didn't reference divorce, but I think divorce would fall into this category. And he'd, he'd include them as well. It is good for them if they abide even as I. It's okay to be single. It, it, there, you're not doing anything wrong by not being married. It's, it's, not, it's not the end all be all. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but i got to hurry. This is just the recap. I haven't even got to today's message. Stop slowing me down. Singleness is a gift of being able to devote yourself to God. That's what it's a gift of. Singleness is the gift of being able to devote yourself to God. Here's what verses 32 and 33 of the same chapter say. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says this. Uh, but I would have you without carefulness, or yeah, 32 through 33. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married, uh, he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Simply meaning, he's saying this, look, if you're single, you can focus a lot more attention on the things that God wants you to do. If you're married... Happy wife, happy life, bro. That's what he said. Pleases his wife. He gets there and says, pleases his wife. Is that not what he said? Here's what he's really saying. Look, I'll use myself. I'm a pastor. I'm in ministry. If I did not have a wife and kids, the, the options of what I could do for ministry, in some respects would shrink, but in some respects would be a lot bigger. I could go a lot more places. By the way, the money. I have more money. <laughs> have I said children are expensive? <laughs> money doesn't bring happiness either, by the way. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. Uh, but I could do a lot more. I could travel more. I would be in a different church every Sunday night. I'd, I'd be here all day, and then I'd leave here, and I'd go visit another church every Sunday night. Why? Because it's encouraging to walk in and be a blessing to a pastor and just say, hey, I'm here, and just looking for some preaching. And you'd be surprised how many pastors just get so excited, to, especially on a Sunday night, to just see some random dude walk in and just be there to get preached at and to, and whatever. He usually they ask me to do something, but... Just be there is a, is a blessing. I did that. I did that every Sunday night. I said, well, why don't you? I got a wife and kids, bro. And my wife's pregnant, and she's like clingy when she's pregnant. So I'm, I'm and I like it that she's clingy. Because I like it when she's clingy. Anyways, uh, that's a different story. Uh, I would do. I'd live a whole different life if I was single. I'd give more money to missions, guarantee it. Because I wouldn't need as much for myself. No, I, I know we talk about faith promise giving and we're like, hey, when you're giving to faith promise, you ought to, you ought to step out by faith and trust that God's going to bring it. And 
Maybe if you knew what number I, we, we give, you may say, well, that don't seem like a step it out by faith. But if you, saw, if you saw our budget, you'd say, well, that's faith. It's faith. That God's going to bring it in. That takes some faith. I'd give more. I would do more for the Lord if I were single. And when you are single, you have the opportunity to fully devote your, yourself to the service of God. Uh, and I said this two weeks ago. I just want to recap it. Your singleness is not so you can please yourself or do whatever you want to do. If you just entertain yourself and go where the wind blows you, that is an affront to the gift that God has given you. The Lord affords you the privilege and opportunity to be fully committed to the work of the Lord. That's what God's given you as a single person. He's clearly letting us know, don't live your life just to get married. And I joked about uh, teen camp, and if you've ever been to teen camps, but it's, even at church camps, not just teen camp, teen church camp. They're there for church, apparently, but man, they're not there for church, they're there for the love of my life. I'm like, bro, you're in seventh grade, but I'm going to find the love of my life this week. Seventh grade, bro. How about you figure out how to wash your hair first, okay? Let's cover that and the spouse later, okay? Let's, let's one baby steps, baby steps. And they're worried. They've got to find that. And we've got this idea. We've got to get married. But the reality is that's, that may not be what God has for you. So here are the points we covered two weeks ago. The first point we covered, and these are just, I'm going to continue today. So this is point number one. If you didn't get them two weeks ago, you can write them down now. You won't get as much about them, but you can write them down first. Marriage is not the source of happiness. No, there's some good things about it. I, again, I love marriage. You never hear me complain about marriage, but it's, that's not the source of happiness. It's not. So how do you know that? Well, on family day, we gave a statistic and we came to the conclusion that only 5% of people that have been married over 20 years would say they'd marry the same person again. 5%! 5! Five. I don't know if I can emphasize that. That's, that blows my mind. I, I, I literally can't get it. But 5% of people would basically say, I'm happily married and I'd marry this person all over again. That's not good. And if, if that's the case, that means marriage doesn't bring happiness. If you're miserable as a single person, you'll probably still be miserable as a married person. You'll just be miserable with somebody else. If you don't figure out how to be joyful as a single person, you're not going to be joyful as a married person. No, no, my wife will bring me joy. No, your wife will bring you headaches. <laughs> well, no, my husband, it'll, be, it'll bring me so much joy to have a husband. No, it's going to annoy the fire out of you that he doesn't know how to get his clothes in the hamper. <laughs> that he doesn't know how to empty the dishwasher. That he doesn't know how to make the bed. Like he's, you're gonna get on your ner- on, he's gonna get on your nerves. You're just gonna be more miserable together. You're gonna watch the same television shows together, except now he's gonna complain about it, and you're gonna complain about his or her shows, whatever. It it does. Being married does not make you happy. That was my first point. Second point: marriage does not equal maturity. Well, if I just got married. I'd really be more mature. Uh, no. If you just grow up, you'll be more mature. <laughs> By the way, I'm all for grow up. I'll say it to anybody and everybody, men and women alike, grow up. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's good to put away childish things every now and then. Just another little tip for you. But marriage does not equal maturity. We, we act like, uh, here's an example, at Bible college, because I was a marriage student, I, 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 I didn't have any rules almost. None. Is Bible college, man, single people, curfews, had to have lights out, had to be here and there, had to dress like this, had to wear that. I mean, they had, they had a hand, big old handbook for the single folks. And it's like married people. It's like, wear a suit to church, all right? Don't be a liberal. That was like, that was it for, for, for the married And we're in Bible college. That was, all, that was my only rule. That was it. Say, so why? Because they automatically think, oh, he's married, he's mature. I'll tell you, I was stupid at 20. <laughs> kind of dumb at 30, but we won't talk about that today. <laughs> That's a message for another time. Marriage does not equal maturity. And by the way, if you're not willing to talk to a single person and get advice from them, you're also dumb. I'm not saying go for, to a single person for parenting advice. Although, if, they're, if, they're, if they can give you biblical advice, that's still sound. Before I ever had kids, I was preaching on parenting. So, how do you do that? Because I'm still preaching on the same Bible. Just because I hadn't put, the practice, or put it into practice myself doesn't mean the principles aren't there. So if, if it's a single person that can say, look, I can tell you what to fix your marriage. Here's the Bible. Don't say, well, you're single. What do you know? If they're saying the Bible, then they're pretty smart. Just saying, okay. And that was, uh, third point was marriage is not better. Just as there are advantages to being married, there are advantages to being single. Well, like what? Um, the longer I'm married, I figured out the less I know. I, I, I try to pay attention in life. I was at the store. This is at two different occasions, two different men. One was, I heard a guy go, walking, I heard the guy say to, look at his wife, and say, I'm hungry. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> That's 
exactly what she said. I thought to myself, praise the Lord that man got married because, man, he could have been eaten when he wasn't even hungry. <laughs> How did he have known? He would never figured it out. He would have eaten while he was full. And then this is the second one. I've seen this happen. A, a dude reaches in for milk, going for whole milk, and his wife goes, you don't drink whole milk. I watched him close it. Didn't argue. Didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. I was like, bro, where's your backbone? I said, I want, if I want red cap, I get red. No, he reached for the skim milk, puts it in, never says it. I was like, man, I'm so glad that guy got married because the longer we're married, the less we know, apparently. Uh, mar- look, marriage is, marriage is great. And those are, I, 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 those are actually real examples. So it's kind of, I'm joking. I'm joking and being serious. Marriage is great, but singleness is also, it's got a, it's, it's got a bunch of great too. Uh, you, could, you could visit most of our missionaries as a single person fairly easily. Most of them can house you as a single person very easily, too. It's a little different when you're like, hey, can my family of five show up? Can my family of six show up? And it's like, hey, I just want to come be a blessing. I just need somewhere to lay and somewhere to shower, and I'm good. It's a little different, isn't it? To say, I can jump, I can get a backpack, jump in a plane, and go anywhere in the world with a backpack with clothes in it and like a bar of soap, and I'm set. Have you ever gone anywhere with kids? No joke, my day off Friday, we spent, we spent half the day looking at cargo carriers for the top of our van. You say, why? Because once we have four kids, we're not going to have enough space for the luggage the kids need. Because each one's got a car seat that's the size, you know, it's just part of life. It's different. If you're single, you've got more freedom. As I said, you can give more to the church. You can serve more in the church. You can do more for missions. There is blessings to being single. It's not married, it's just different. I quoted Elizabeth Woodson who said, God's best for many includes a life without a, sp- a spouse and biological children. But pastor, that's what I've always wanted. I know. I understand. I, you're not going to... I, I sympathize. I, I feel for you because I love marriage. But that just may not be what God has for you. Or maybe not for what he has for you right now. You never know. I mean, who did, who, Mike Marshall would have never probably guessed that in his 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s that by the end of his 50s he'd be getting married. He'd probably never guessed. It's... It, it may not be what has, God has for you now. So now here's our points for today. So aren't you glad we went through all that? We didn't even got into the, our message. Let's recap. No, I'm, I'm going to hurry. I'm going to hurry. All right. Uh, we can go through this one fast, but I, I don't want to rush through it. I want to help us. Marriage is God's only outlet for sexual gratification. Marriage is God's only outlet for sexual gratification. Verse 1 through 5, it explains that. It talks about a husband and wife. And, and it, don't forget, the Bible was not written with chapters and verses. So you can go back to chapter 6, and we're going to here, and it, we'll read some verses. Uh, so look at chapter 6 with me. So right before he gets into talking about intimacy and marriage, here's what he says in verse number 18. Chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19. What? Know ye, not that, uh, that, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? He's letting, he's letting you know, if you, if, you do, if you are not married, you don't have any... Okay, here, let me just make it easy for you. Fornication is from the Greek word pornea. What word do you think we get pornea from? Pornography. So here's what he's saying. If you're not married, you don't have any outlet for any of that. So well, I need an outlet. No, you don't. It's not what God said. By the way, it's, it's, this is the only place I've found that this, fornication is the only sin that you're sinning against yourself. You're not sinning against God. You're not sinning against man. You're sinning against yourself. Now, by the way, you're hurting other people too. Well, I'm just watching something on the internet. It's not hurting. First off, you don't know what kind of situations the people on the other side of that screen were put through to be in those places because... And we're going to get into some statistics about porn- pornography. and I'm not, It's not fun, and I know there's children, and I, I get all that. Uh, but but I, I want to be in front of this as a pastor, and I want to help the parents to be in front of this. But I want to help single people know the, the, amount, of, the amount of what you see on that screen when it comes to pornography that is, that is not consensual, it's not a great situation, it's, it's, it's appalling. Uh, sex trafficking industry is surviving on the pornography industry. Sex trafficking is a big deal because there is a thing like pornography. Just, it, it's, it's appalling. And so anyways, uh, you say, well, I've got to find an outlet. No, you don't. You don't need an outlet. God said you don't need an outlet. There's no point for you to. Fornication means this. Any sexual expression outside of a marriage covenant. That includes everything from more pornography to messing around with somebody to oral to Netflix and chilling, all of that. Now, for you old folks, I'm not going to explain Netflix and chill. Go ask one of your grandkids. 
Uh, if they're an adult. <laughs> a 13-year-old granddaughter. What's Netflix? No, don't, don't do that. Uh, all right. So now, like I said, we're going to talk about pornography. And I, I realize there's kids in the room. But parents, let me, let me encourage you. I, I was exposed to my first, and it was paper back then, because I am that old. Uh, it was a, a torn out piece of some kind of Playboy or something. I was exposed to my first pornography in third or fourth grade. Third or fourth grade. I wasn't going to some wicked school. That's just, that's society. And I guarantee now that I'm 30, I'm betting that it's earlier. Stumbling upon that stuff is earlier now. I'm betting. So I'm telling you this because parents, you need to be aware too. While I'm preaching to singles and marrieds, I'm preaching to parents too. So here's some statistics. I'm going to run through them very fast uh, because we don't have time. Where'd all my time go? Did somebody move the clock hand? Here we go. According to the Huff Post, porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each month. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. That's WebRoot. 34% of internet users have been exposed to unwanted porn via ads, pop-ups, etc. Well, I let my kids use the internet, but it's, it's fine. They, they're not going to search anything weird. Even if they don't search it, it's going to find them. Satan will make sure of that. At least 30% of all data transferred across the internet is porn-related. That's from HuffPost. The most common female role stated in porn titles is that of a woman in their 20s portraying a teenager. Why would that be? Because men are wicked. We have wicked minds. John Miller did a 2013 study, conducted the largest personal research study on the industry. Uh, number six, recorded child sex exploitation is one of the fastest growing online businesses. That's IWF. 624 million plus child porn traders have been discovered online in the U.S. In the U.S. So this is disgusting. Yeah, but I'm trying to share this with you. We've got to understand what we're dealing with here, people. Between 2005 and 2009, child porn was hosted on servers located in, in all 50 states. That's child porn. That was back over a decade ago. And that was the Association of Sites Advocating for Child Protection. Porn is a global industry estimates in $97 billion of it is a $97 billion industry with about $12 billion of that coming from the U.S. That's NBC News. In, in 2018 alone, more than... 5 billion, 517 million hours of porn were consumed on the world's largest porn site, which I'm not going to give you that because I don't even want to say the name. 11 pornography sites are among the world's top 300 most popular internet sites. The most popular such sites at, at number 18 outranks the likes of eBay, MSN, and Netflix, similar web. The world's largest free porn site uh, also received over 33 billion, 500 million site visits during 2018 alone. And in case you just think it's an adult problem, consider these. 64% of young people ages 13 to 24 actively seek out pornography weekly or more. What that means is if you have 1,000 teenagers, 1,000 teenage boys from 13 to 24, I know some of those are adults. I'm, if you could just get, the, if you get 1,000 of them, 640 would say, yes, I search out pornography weekly. A study of 14 to 19 year olds found that females who consumed pornographic videos were at significantly greater likelihood of being victim of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Apparently, it makes them put down their guard. A Swedish study of 18 year old males found that frequent consumers of pornography were significantly more likely to have sold and bought sex uh, than other boys of the same age. In 2015, meta analysis of 22 studies from seven countries found that internationally, the consumption of pornography was significantly associated with increase, increases in verbal and physical aggression among males and females. With that being said, what, what, what they're saying there is they're learning from pornography to be aggressive in something that, that God means to be beautiful, which I'm talking about intimacy and marriage. And that's why, if, you're a if you are a father of a daughter, there's no boy coming around my daughters that, ha that are struggling with pornography. Now, if it's something that they've gotten victory over in the past, I'm going to try to be gracious. But if it's something they struggle with right then, you better hope you can run faster than me. But I stay in pretty good shape. And odds are you're not going to win. I'll send you to meet Jesus. You say, man, that's it. You ought to have some grace, Pastor. No, I ought to have some backbone and protect my daughter because I don't want her to get into a marriage where she's going to, be ex ex she's going to experience abuse from a guy that's been experiencing watching abuse on a television screen or on a computer screen or on a cell phone screen for the last five years. I'm not exposing my daughter to that. Forget that. We'll go meet Jesus together if we have to, but... A recent UK survey found that 44% of males aged 11 through 16 who consumed pornography reported that online pornography gave them ideas about the type of sex they wanted to try. Why do you bring all that up, Pastor? This is church. It's all over. 
No, everybody, everybody else is talking about it, first off. Let, let's get there. Everybody else is talking about it. Kids at school are talking about it. Teenagers are talking about it. Every movies are joking about it now. It's just a jovial thing. I, I didn't include, I have way more statistics, statistics than these. We can talk about the amount of people that, that have no care. They, they think it's neutral. They don't even care. They think it's nothing. Most of our generations, including all the way up to Gen Xers, I didn't get above Gen Xers to baby boomers, but a vast majority of even Gen Xers think that pornography is okay. It is everywhere else. So why wouldn't I, as your pastor, and I love you, talk about this? So here's why I bring it up. First, because many single people are consuming that kind of filth weekly. Can't. We're going to talk about what it's doing to you in a minute. But Second, because people who should be married, because God didn't give the singleness gift to everybody. People who should be married are foregoing marriage because they found an outlet to where they can easily and cheaply satisfy their own lusts. When they're supposed to be married. And third, it's good every now and then to remind parents of what's out there and that we got to be on guard. Amen. we got to be on guard. Oh, it's just a phone. It's just an app. It's just Twitter. It's just, it's just Snapchat. It's just, it's, just, it's just Internet. No, it's just nothing like that. It's Satan. Amen. All right. If God has given you the gift of singleness, he's also given you the ability to overcome the temptations of the world. No, Pastor, I'm telling you, I can't overcome it. I've been trying to get victory. Well, first let me say, I am willing to help anybody get victory over these things. I've worked with many people who, it's, it's alarming how much material I've had to read because I want to be, have more information to be able to help counsel and get people through those things. But I'm telling you this, if God, he, he will never tempt you above what you can handle. The Bible says that. You'll never be tempted above what you can handle. So if God is, if Satan's tempting with you with it, God has given you the gift to get over it. Understand, according to 1 Corinthians 6.18, when you commit fornication, you are sinning against yourself, meaning you're hurting yourself just as much as others. Now, I want to get a little bit scientific with you, and I'm not, I don't pretend to be that smart or pretend to know, but I've, I, I've, I've done a lot of research on this, on the brain, and, on, and, and, and here's what's alarming. Whenever, man, I've got to be fast. <laughs> Hurry up. Okay, here we go. Whenever we are exposed to novelty, it releases a, a dopamine rush into our brain. Dopamine is what makes you want to come back for more. That's why your little cell phone games, that most of y'all probably have a cell phone game that you just always come back to, and it's just so fun and candy crush, and level 2042, and, and oh, you know, what the problem, you, know what, you know what's addictive about that? It's the dopamine rush of the novelty. Well, pornography is constant novelty. New, new, new. So uh, the, the scroll, here's what I'm getting to. Your brain will rewire itself to get dopamine rushes easier. It literally, you're rewiring your brain when you're consuming pornography. And here's the downside to it. It's hard to fix. Once your brain's rewired, you say, well, how do you fix it? Here's the greatest thing. Reading and meditating are the two things that, that can rewire your brain and get you back to healthy. Isn't it funny that's two things that God told us to do, to read the Word and meditate on it? Just saying. It's, science, God, Bible, science backs up Bible every time, just to let you know. But here's what, here's what I want to get at. You are hurting yourself in the long run. If, if you are single and God does allow you to get married one day, you are going to struggle to be fulfilled sexually in that marriage if you've, if you've rewired your brain to need new all the time. Because I'll be honest, you're never going to have new once you get married. Been married for 10 years, it's been the same woman. There's no new. There's no new. And if your brain is accustomed to the only time you can be satisfied and feel fulfilled is whenever you get something new, then you are going to be sadly unfulfilled in your marriage and it's going to cause it's i'm telling you i've sat with couples it's going to cause her to feel insecure it's going to cause you to feel insecure because you're not performing in the way that you felt like you should and both of you are going to be miserable and upset and it's going to be bad because it affects you, you say why are you telling because i care about people i want if god does let you be single i want you to live a fulfilled single life not one where i've talked to guys who can't get through work without going and doing stuff on their phone in bathrooms and work i mean i've, I've, I've counseled guys that are that go through this, and I don't, want to, and I don't want anybody else here to do that. So singles, stay away from fornication. Flee it even. That, listen to this. That fulfillment won't last, but the shame and the damage will. The fulfillment's going to go quick. You think you want fulfillment, and then you get the fulfillment, and then it's over in like 30 seconds, and then you just feel shame and disgusting and vile. Now, if you've already messed up, let me, be, let me encourage you that God is a gracious God. And if, you've, if you're saved and you've asked him to forgive you, he's forgiven you. And it's done and it's over. And you can continue on your life as if it never happened because to God it never happened. Uh, that's if you repent, meaning you turn from it. 
And if you are single and you need, uh, you need a godly person to discuss your sexual frustrations with, if you're a single person, I'm willing to be that for you, unless you're a woman. If you're a woman, you need to find a godly lady to talk to about it. Next, and last, last point, your relationship status is supposed to be a picture of the gospel. Now, some of y'all are like, okay, I know that for marriage. Yeah, I'm with you. Some of y'all are already like, all right, I'm with you. Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about how marriage is like an imperfect picture of the gospel. Yeah, marriage, picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. I got that one. But how could singleness... Well, let me encourage you in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 20. Let's read that first, and then let me encourage you with this thought. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Now, this is specifically talking about circumcised and uncircumcised, but I'm telling you this applies to everything, including singleness, which is still part of this chapter, which is still in its context. Um, so we have said, and rightly so, that marriage is an imperfect picture of God's love for the church. But listen to this. Uh, this is, I'm not going to take credit for this. This is a woman, by the way, genius. She, Jennifer Grisham, she wrote five things single... Uh, singles wish married people knew. By the way, if you knew the books I read to prepare for this, you single people should appreciate it a little more. Uh, here's what she said. Marriage is hard, and you grow a lot through it. Nobody doubts that. But singleness is also hard, and you grow a lot through it. Marriage paints a picture of Christ's love for the church. Listen, singleness paints a picture of Christ's sufficiency and the joy of a life that accept the fa- accepts the Father's will as Jesus did when he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. That's good. I'm going to repeat that. Singleness paints a picture of Christ's sufficiency and the joy of a life that accepts the Father's will as Jesus did when he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. In my singleness, I've learned and relearned that I will not be put to shame for trusting God in my life. She referenced in Psalms 25, 1 through, 20, or 1 through 3. I have needed reminders that, uh, that I am not trying to have my best life now or to single-handedly realize my hopes. No, I need to live and serve with my eyes on the happiness that awaits me in heaven. My desires may be partially fulfilled today, but they will be completely fulfilled when I am in the presence of Christ. God is growing and sanctifying us all the time. Want to know what is most uh, sanctifying? Wherever God has placed you right now. Sanctification comes from God regardless of your marital status. Lori Ferguson Wilbert wrote this. For 34 years, I believe that since marriage was the picture of the gospel, then there must be some mysterious element of the gospel I would never understand unless I was married. I believe there was some super secret club for those who understood the gospel fully, and the closest I would ever come was standing on the margins, alternately looking at the married and back at myself, a single self, trying to see what I was missing. First, I reasoned I was missing a husband. Second, I was missing uh, consummation. Third, I was missing uh, the covenant. I added these up and summarized and, and surmised my understanding of the gospel would be partial, incomplete, and unresolved till heaven or marriage, whichever came first. While my addictions were right, or additions were right, and the sums were correct, the math I had done to arrive there was terribly wrong. I was without a husband, sex, and the covenant of marriage, but the lack of those did not necessarily equal a lesser understanding of the gospel, and my understanding of the gospel was still partial, incomplete, and will be partial and incomplete and unresolved until heaven, but it is not because of my singleness, it is because of my humanness. I know that was a long quote, but I hope you stayed with it. That was good. Singleness should lend itself to a closer relationship with Jesus. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5 says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Jesus also quoted it multiple times. Marriage is wonderful, but it can distract people from the covenantal love. Singles, you are not distracted. Now, sometimes singles distract themselves by trying to think about what it'd be like if they weren't single. But let me encourage you, if you're single, you're not distracted. You can fully give your life over to God because Jesus is the only thing that satisfies. I've got to hurry. Here we go. Uh, here's the conclusion. Ah, okay. It's like three pages. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go through it fast. I, I got some practical tips. I'm not going to elaborate. Just bear with me. Here we go. Number one, if you're single, focus more on being a part of the bride the church, than being a bride or groom. I thought that was clever. Uh, (laughs) Get involved in the covenantal marriage. Do more in the church. Be more involved. Be more devoted. If you're single, focus more on God, and you can focus less on trying to be married. Uh, Number two, while many will get married, many will not. Are you okay with that? If, if you ne- if you're single and you never get married, are you okay with that? And the sooner you will be satisfied, the sooner you accept the gift of singleness, the sooner you'll be satisfied and fulfilled in the life that God has given you. Number three, God does use single people. Paul, Apollos, Timothy, uh, the disciple John, uh, our favorite. We took a vote. It was unanimous. Jesus, single. Okay. All right. Now, this is for everyone. To everyone, let's learn to discuss more than people's relationship status so that 
One, we're not overly focused on what God isn't focused on. You know, God's not really that focused on our marital status. Like if you're married, great. God knows he gave you the gift of a spouse, but he's not every day thinking about all the fact that you're married and he's not thinking about the fact that you're single. He's focused on bigger things like what? Like the great commission, like seeing people get saved and coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But two, so we can focus on spiritual things. Here's what I'm encouraging. Learn to ask spiritual questions. I feel like we automatically, because we don't know what to talk about with people that are single or, or that with people in general, we automatically go to their relationship status. I don't have Facebook, but I understand that on Facebook, you can put your marital status on there, right? Is that, is that factual? It's like one of your questions and then marital status or sta- relationship status, whatever it says. I don't know. I don't have it. Why is that there? Because that's all we know to talk about. You dating anyone? You see anybody? You married? How about you grow up a little bit, learn to talk about more than just somebody's relationship. And here's a great thing. If you're at church, ask a spiritual question. Read anything good in your Bible? Now, by the way, the answer is yeah. But to get specifically, it was all good. Here's the part that I really enjoyed. So, uh, you know, what has the Lord been working on your heart with lately? And you say, well, those are weird questions. Not as weird as when you go, so, so are you dating anybody? And they go, no. That's awkward. All right, for married people, I'm helping singles. Let me help you out by helping the married people out. Most people would like to be married. Remember that when you're talking to single folks. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says this, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. God has given you a mouth and a brain to know when to keep your mouth shut or when to say something that will encourage somebody that's weary. If they're single, don't ask stupid questions. Don't say stupid things. The pastor shouldn't say stupid. Well, I just did. (laughs) Well, pastor, I'm just trying to be funny with them. Well, there's only like 12 funny people in all the world. I'm one of them. You're not. Quit trying to be funny. Number two, singles are just as mature as married people. We already covered that. Not going into it again. Number three, singles need to be respected just like married people. Just because they're at a different, a different place in life or in a different um, gift of God doesn't mean that you should treat them any less than you would. A, uh, well, you know, we only really have married couples over. We only, I only ask you find some married people. You're an idiot. Okay, moving on. I got to hurry. As a church and as a pastor, we prefer singleness than marrying the wrong person just to not be alone. I would, rather you be me- I would rather you be single than marrying the wrong person just so that you're not alone. As I said two weeks ago, the loneliest people I know are people who are married to the wrong person. Number five, stop playing Cupid. Cupid. Cupid is stupid. Oh, it rhymes. I'm gonna, that's my new slogan. Cupid is stupid. Cupid is stupid. We're going to get that going. I'm going to get it on a t-shirt. Listen, don't project your likes onto somebody else. Oh, girl, he's a hottie. Uh, he's 10 years her senior and she don't care. Or, or she, oh, man she's, I don't, man, she's gorgeous. I don't know why you wouldn't go after her uh, because I know her and she's crazy. That's why I wouldn't go after her. Quit projecting your likes. Let God lead them in their relationships if he wants. Next, singles like to build relationships with married folks beyond just being a babysitter. Hey, you want to come over and watch the kids so we can go on a date night? Single people like to go out too. Not like out to clubbing or nothing, but Christian going out. That means we go eat and then eat and watch TV. I don't, I don't, know. I don't know what to do. So what do you do? I work. I don't know what the rest of y'all do. You will be enriched by a real relationship with single people. And by the way, it's always awkward for them. It's always hard for them. It takes all the grace that they have in their heart not to feel like the third will, the fifth will, the whatever. You ought to be good. You ought, you ought to make it as easy as possible for them. Number seven, don't ask them if they're in a relationship. Don't ask what I'm curious. Then keep your mouth shut with your curiosity. Nothing's worse than saying, are you in a relationship when they don't really want to talk about it? If they're not in a relationship and they feel ashamed about not being in a relationship, you just made their shame worse. If they're in a relationship and they don't want you to know because you'll tell everybody on Facebook, then it's awkward because they're going to have to lie to you. Don't ask. Last one. Be considerate. You would never walk up to a married couple and go, so how, how bad is it being married, honestly? What is it like? Is it lonely? Does it suck? You wouldn't do that to a married couple. Don't do that to single people either. Don't walk up to a single man, man, I don't know how you do it. It must suck, huh? Alone all the time. Or vice, the, the opposite of that is, man, your life's so great. Being single, doing whatever you want. Yeah, there's the advantages of singleness, but don't, don't forget, they would probably trade all that in in a minute, in a New York minute, to have a wife and kids. Or a husband and kids. And so you're going, man, your life's so great. You can do whatever you want. You got no ball and chain chain. That's not, that's not helping. It's not being considered, it's just hurting. Okay, we got to be done. The same truth 
uh, from last message is how I want to end this one. Jesus really is enough. Jesus really is enough. If you, if you have a great relationship with Jesus as a single person, it's enough. If you have a great relationship with Jesus as a married person, it's enough. And I want to end it by saying this. Maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can know him beyond just what the Bible says about him, beyond just what Hollywood paints a picture of him. You can know him personally. So how do you know that? Because the Bible says that we can know that we have eternal life. And Jesus Christ really did come. He really did die. He really was dead for three days. He really did rise from the grave. He really did ascend up into heaven and, and resurrected and ascend from, up into heaven. And he promised that where he went, he would prepare a place for you and come again and receive you unto himself. That where he is, you can be there also. He promised all that. What that is is salvation. Very simply, to be saved, you need to just do four things you need to number one acknowledge that you're a sinner you got to believe that you're wrong and you got to know that you're wrong the things you do wrong that's pretty easy i think most of us get that uh number two you have to believe in what i just said that jesus christ really did die for your sins and he paid the debt and that uh then number three you have to pray and ask him to save you number four believing that he will not just oh god save me if you don't believe every time you if you don't have enough faith to, when you're saying god save me to believe that he will god uh forgive me my sins take me to heaven if you don't have enough faith to believe that then you're not going to get saved you're just going to talk to the ceiling okay that was a really short salvation but if you want to talk about salvation more uh, our tracks on the back wall over there uh they tell the plan of salvation on the back you don't need my help if you would like to talk to me i'm willing to talk to anybody about it and most of our church members are as well but we've got to be done so i'm gonna ask everybody heads bowed and eyes closed I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and ask God that if he's worked on your life, maybe to find um, some peace in being single. Maybe it's to be a better married person. <laughs> maybe it's just that you need to be saved and you're convicted of that. I'm going to ask God to